Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. At the back, clearly. Yes. Good. Super. Um, how many of you have used my form of mapping? Oh, blimey, that's a quarter. Maybe a fifth. That's fantastic news. Okay, so I'm going to give you an uh, introduction into, into mapping. I'm going to start off with the issue of strategy. Um, I'm going to talk about maps and why they matter. And then I'm going to leave a few notes about maps and then talk about communication, which is primarily what they're used for, communication and learning. Um, it, I've got a number of other sessions. I'll quickly give an overview of those as well at the end, uh, where we'll be going into more details like weak signal analysis, different types of patterns, uh, organizational structure. So let's start with the issue of strategy. For me, this started uh, 2003, 2004. I was working for this company, uh, Tango. About 16 different lines of business. Uh, about 10 million users in total across all of them. Uh, very profitable, revenue was growing, uh, but it had a problem. And the problem was this person, the CEO, <coughs> the fat cat in charge. You see, our fat cat was a fake CEO. They didn't know what they were doing. They were making it up as they went along, despite the fact that we were growing in revenue and profitability. Now, I knew this because I was the CEO. <laughs> All right, I haven't got a clue. Uh, we had, you know, wonderful sort of strategy and vision statements, uh, things like um, 2003, our strategy is customer focused. Uh, we will lead an innovative effort to market through our use of agile techniques and open source. I heavily adopted extreme programming in the organization around 2002. Um, of course, by 2004, we discovered it didn't work everywhere. But nonetheless, we had these wonderful statements. Now, the problem with these statements, I pinched them from other companies and literally changed a few words. So I was worried that people would rumble that I didn't know what I was talking about. So I used to go to conferences like this with a tape recorder and record another CEO's talking about strategy. And I used to go home and, and record all the words. And I'd look for those key words, what I called business level abstractions of a healthy strategy or BLAS for short. And I've done this every couple of years. Uh, so this is about 2014, here are the common BLAS. Uh, digital business, big data, disruptive, innovative, uh, collaborative, competitive advantage, uh, ecosystem open source, blah, blah, blah. Um, if I did it today, what words would you hear? Blockchain. Blockchain. Can't do anything without a bit of blockchain, AI. yeah. AI. AI, everybody's gonna have a bit of AI. <laughs> yeah, what else? Absolutely. Serverless, yeah, yeah, yeah. Most people haven't got a clue what that means either. Yeah. RPA. Huh? RPA. RPA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any other words? Machine learning. Machine learning, yes. Everybody does that one as well, yes. Right. So what I did was I took a whole bunch of company strategy documents and vision statements and created a BLA template. So our strategy is blah, we will lead a blah effort of the market through our use of blah and blah to build a blah. And then I randomly combined the blahs and the blah templates and auto-generated 64 different strategies. <laughs> Things like this. Our strategy is customer focus. We will lead a disruptive effort of the market through our use of customer focus, competitive advantage, and uh, oh, sorry, a use of innovative social media, sorry in this case, and big data to, uh, to build a collaborative cloud-based ecosystem. <laughs> and things like this. <laughs> Our strategy is innovative digital business. We will lead a great effort of the market through use of this time customer focused competitive advantage and disruptive social media to build a collaborative revolution. <laughs> so I, I sent these around. I got 400 responses the last time I did this of three basic times. The first response was this is the exact wording from our business plan. <laughs> <laughs> The second one is, I've seen two of these used already. And the third one, and my favorite, was an eye for eye. <laughs> so a friend of mine has put this all online. This is strategy as a service. Um, so if you ever need a strategy, it's pretty simple. Just type in the URL. It will generate you one based upon nothing whatsoever. If it, if, if it makes you feel comfortable, you can pretend there's blockchain and AI behind it. And if you don't like it, it's really simple. You just press refresh. And you just keep on going until you find something you do like. Saves a lot of money in terms of consultancy. 
Anyway, so um, I realized that I might not be the only one who was making it up. So I wasn't the chess playing sort of master or whatever people say. I was more the alchemist. I was making it up as I went along, didn't have a clue. When it came to navigation learning, and things like strategy, I was all about storytelling, secrets of success, and magic frameworks. I used to love my magic frameworks. Uh, anybody uh, read Harvard Business Review? HBR, have you heard of it? Yes? This is my favorite article from HBR. It's November 2011. It's how earlobes can signify leadership potential. In management, we really have got to the phrenology of management. I mean, I, I always advise, grab your CEO, uh, pin them to the ground, measure their earlobe, and, and uh, well, anyway, no, I don't advise doing that. But um, yes, literally, how earlobes can signify leadership potential. This is not an April Fool. We live in business in what we describe as a, what I would describe as a low situational awareness environment. What I wanted to be was more like chess. Visual, the game at hand, context specific, you know, the game that I'm playing. So before I can see where the pieces are, um, I want to learn. Strategy is all about position and movement, the pieces on the board. It's what we call a high level situational awareness environment. It's a bit like the military. If you ask a general, why did you bomb that hill? They won't tell you because I read an article in General Weekly saying bombing hills is the latest thing. They won't tell you I had some consultant come in saying 67% of other generals are doing AI for me for bombing hills and therefore I should go bomb a hill. And they won't tell you, well, I bomb that hill because that's what Uber would do. It's all about position and movement. Okay? So I got into military history, started off with uh, Themistocles, uh, the Battle of Thermopylae. Themistocles, ancient politician, Greek general. Now, I had a problem. The Persians were invading. About 170,000 Persians. And what he decided to do was to block off the Straits of Artemisium, force the Persians along the coastal road into an narrow pass. It's called Thermopylae, where a small number of troops could defend uh, against a much larger force. There were about 4,000 Greeks, including 300. Oh. Oh. Perfect. All right, I want you to imagine it's the eve of battle. Your, uh, uh, your members of the Athenian city state, uh, part of the Greek city state, you're, uh, uh, you're part of the army, and um, it's the eve of battle, and I'm giving you purpose, so moral imperative, we want to uh, stop the Persians invading, and, and then I tell you, I don't understand the landscape, I don't understand the environment, I don't have a map, but have no fear, but I have created a swap diet. Strength, so war trains my army, a high level of motivation not to become a Persian slave. Uh, weaknesses, the E4s might stop the Spartans turning up, a truckload of Persians are turning up. Opportunities, get rid of the Persians, get rid of the Spartans, we're actually Athenian, we hate the Spartans. And, and the threats, the Persians get rid of us, and the oracle says a really dodgy film might be produced a few thousand years later. <laughs> so what would you use to communicate the term strategy in battle? Position and movement, described by a map of some sort of magic framework like a swap diagram. <laughs> what do you think we use in business? <laughs> okay. What I realized was the difference between the two environments of low and high situational awareness is basically the existence or non existence of a map. Now, I work with all sorts of interesting companies and governments. In, in, in most cases, it doesn't matter, because in the banking world, you can be utterly hopeless and have zero situational awareness, and it's perfectly fine, because you're competing against everybody else who's in exactly the same position. You only have to worry about having good situational awareness and being able to play the game when you come up against somebody who can do this. I mean, we did this with canonical Ubuntu. It cost me half a million and 18 months to take Ubuntu from 3% of the operating system market to 70% of all cloud. And that was against Microsoft and Red Hat. And it was simple because we were playing the game and they couldn't see it. So, if maps are important, what is a map? Well, this is a graph. Nottingham, London, Dover. 
M1, M2. <coughs> this is a map. You see the difference. Let's go back. This is a graph. This is a map. You see the difference? A compass. All right. To explain it again, these three graphs are identical. Not Nottingham, London, Dover. Nottingham, London, Dover. Dover, London, Nottingham. They're identical. Same nodes, same connections. These three maps are different. Okay? The critical thing about a map is in a map, space has meaning. And that comes from the fact that you have an anchor. So in the case of geographical maps, you have a, a north, you have the position of pieces relative to an anchor, and you have what's called consistency of movement. So if I go north, I go north, not south. So, for example, if I want to go from Thebes to Thermopylae, which way would I go? Northwest. If I go northwest from Thebes and I end up at Athens, what does that tell me? Maps wrong or <laughs> compass is wrong. Perfect. All right. So, in my business, I had loads of maps systems maps, business process maps, loads of them. So, I took one of my systems maps, and this is for one line of business, took the box CRM and moved it. How has that changed the map? It hasn't. If I take an atlas and I ship Australia and put it next to London, does that change the map? <laughs> right, why do you think this doesn't change this map? It's not a map. It's not a map. Okay. Almost everything in business that we have, which we call a map, has one thing in common, which is? No. It's not a map. I'm afraid we keep using that word and it doesn't mean what we think it means. <laughs> but we want it to be a map, because maps are you know, good for exploration and learning, etc. It's a bit like, I want to be a Jedi. But calling myself a Jedi doesn't give me a lightsaber and the ability to move things with thought. So how to create a map? I took a systems diagram, and very simply put an anchor at the top. In this case, the customer. You can have many anchors. You can have the customer, you can have business, you can have regulators. The next thing is to describe position, and you do that through a partial ordered list, a chain of needs. Because what it turns out is this needs that, needs this, needs that. Now I've got anchor and position. Last thing I need is movement. And that is done by adding an evolution access. Things evolve. You start off with the first phone, you get a better phone, a better phone, a better phone, and eventually phones become a commodity. So there is a pattern of evolution where we start off with the genesis of novel and new things, custom built examples, product and rental services, commodity and utility services. And that was the first map that I did in 2005. So, a few notes. One, these are maps of capital. What we're talking about is evolving capital. Now those are just labels. They're really labels for stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four, but that's fairly meaningless. Now it's not just physical activities that evolve, it's also uh, practices evolve, data evolves, knowledge evolves. They all evolve through the same stages, just we give them different labels. So for example, I can take knowledge from observation, hypothesis, theory to accept it, and I can map science. More importantly, I can map political systems, legal systems, and ethical systems. But we don't use those labels, we just use the generic ones at the bottom. Two, all maps are imperfect representations. A perfect map of France is what scale? Which means it is the size of? Which means it is? So is it useful as a map? No. Okay, maps are all imperfect representations. Secondly, maps don't start off being good, they start off as being very primitive, uh, with lots of perceptions, early maps, uh, geographical maps, lots of religious uh, um, uh, connotations put into them. Over time, it developed. These are the early maps, they're not the same as the ordnance survey maps you get today. Of course, since mapping maps different forms of capital, I can actually map maps themselves. So, which is what I did many years ago, starting with my purpose to, you know, my need to survive, make revenue, the imperative, the scope, there's my user, which was my main anchor, and they had things like getting, gaining 
advantage over competitors. Hopefully they wanted to learn mapping, I had to validate the use of mapping. And the purpose of mapping is once you have a map, you can see the assumptions somebody else is making, you can challenge those assumptions, you can learn patterns, they're useful for anticipation, and more importantly, you can add intent. Where I wish to drive this, how am I going to play this market? Which is why I made all the mapping stuff open creative for share alike, because I want to drive it to more of a commodity. Except for one area, context-specific gameplay. I have a desire to be an arms dealer. Now, the next thing about maps is they are not only semantic, but symbolic representations of a space, which means you get lots of images like this. That is a mountain. It is not actually a mountain. It's just simply a representation. Lastly, maps aren't easy. This is a very simple war map. The Battle of Waterloo, if I remember correctly. Um, there's a lot of stuff you have to learn about maps to effectively use them. So if they're wrong, if they're imperfect, you have to put effort in. If they're representations, why on earth do we use them? Well, despite all these thoughts, thoughts they have uses. This is a map of a Roman city. <coughs> on this map, there are about 20 points of interest. There are five residential areas and five military outposts. The total number of paths, discrete paths of A to B, is approximately 435. If you wrote each path as a story of 25 words, such as move along the path, turn left at the oak tree, etc., uh, that would take you about 10,000 words. Literally, a picture is worth 10,000 words. But that is the discrete paths. If we get into the permutations of those paths, then you're talking approximately uh, 300, I don't know how big that number is, bytes. This is the problem with storytelling. This is a map of the emergency communication mobile platform, which is a critical infrastructure for police, fire, and ambulances. That map is a 600-page specification document on a single page. And the point about the page is I can look at it and I go, well, come on. Devices, they're more of a commodity these days. We can have a discussion about how we're building things and what we're building and what components are missing. Which brings me to communication. I'm gonna use a cup of tea. A business wants to sell cups of tea. It hopes the public has a need for cups of tea. Now a cup of tea itself has needs. It needs cups, it needs tea, it needs hot water. And hot water needs cold water, and hot water needs a kettle. And a kettle needs power. The first thing that happens with a map is when you share it with someone, and it doesn't matter whether I'm mapping nation-state competition or China or an individual system or a political system or the security of something. The first thing that happens is people go, oh, you're missing something, like star. And then someone will come along, oh, star. They're not really a product, they're more of a commodity agency, let's buy robots, okay? Well, we can have that discussion. And then each of these nodes on this map is actually a stock of capital, and each of the lines is a bi-directional exchange of capital, so we can add metrics to it. The public gets a cup of tea for 55 cents, so there's a physical exchange for a financial exchange. And from that, we can build a p &L. And then somebody else will come along and look at my map and say, why are we using custom-built kettles? Why are we using standard kettles? And we can look at the impact of that. Maybe it's just a technical debt. Maybe there's some reason for using custom-built kettles, some sort of brand exclusivity. <laughs> now, as I said, you don't have to just use that, that access. That just represents or labels for stage one, two, three, or four of capital. You can add different forms of capital. You could use those labels instead, and that's how you map ethical systems. So in ethics, we have concepts which then become emerging and a convergent opinion of what it is and finally becomes accepted and usually embedded in law. So I can take my map of my cup of tea and add things like ethical trade. We've got converging opinions on what it is. Fair conditions. I can add green energy and renewable energy.
Now, of course, I don't use those labels, concept, emerging, converging. We just use Genesis Custom Built Product. There are about 30 common economic patterns, uh, 40 different forms of doctrine, 120 different forms of gameplay, which you can use to manipulate and anticipate changes on a map. Of course, most people don't see the environment. All they ever see are the words innovation. Every genesis is an innovation. Every custom built is an innovation. Every product and feature is an innovation. Every commodity form of business shift of a, a product to a utility form is called an innovation. So, so we never see the landscape. We can never determine uh, these patterns. But once you break it out, one of the magical things that I find is it doesn't matter if you're from finance or HR or operations or business or IT or what you're from. We can all discuss how the landscape is changing using a single map. Business alignment is an issue for me from 14 years ago. I mean, it's purely an artifact of the way we communicate. And once you have a map, then you can show intent, or what we call commander's intent. So I have the intention we're no longer going to be using custom-built kettles, we're going to be using standard kettles. And of course, everybody else, each of these nodes can be an entire map itself, can see what the impact of that intent is on their area. But the best thing about those is learn. Because once you have a map, and in government we have some maps which are a decade old, uh, we were sitting down a couple of weeks ago with maps which are six years old, which have the maps and the intent, we can see what has changed, what our context was at the time, and what we believed would be changing. And that's actually how we learn, or how I learn. I have never in my life gone back and looked at a SWOT diagram or a business model that I've created, and I've created loads. I don't learn from that, whereas I do learn from maps. And it doesn't matter whether I'm talking about a cup of tea, you know, an individual uh, uh, system, or reducing uh, poverty at, uh, at the UN and uh, uh, the impacts on all the different components. But it's also helpful for communication between teams. So I'll give you one example, which is um, to do with weighing scales. There is a department in government which receives a count from an agency. That count is produced once a month. That count comes from weighing machines. What happens is there are so many paper forms produced, it's cheaper to weigh them to work out the volume of paper forms, the number, than it is to count them. So that's what they do. They take these pallet loads of paper forms and they weigh them to work out the number of paper forms. And then they put that into a system, and at the end of the month, they report this number, this count, to this other agency. Now, they're going through a digital transformation program at the moment. And what that means to them is replacing weighing scales with more digital weighing scales connected to their system. All right? Very simple. So I asked them, OK, you're counting paper forms. Where do the paper forms come from? And they said they come from Goods In, okay? So I walked down to Goods In, asked Goods In, where do you get your paper forms from? Oh, they come from distribution sites all over the country. We've got about 40, 40 of them. Okay, go on to a distribution site. Where are you getting your paper forms from? Oh, we print them out. You print them out, yes, we print them out. And then you send them to this other group, yes. Do you know what they do with them? No, okay. Um, and where are you printing them out from? Oh, our CRM system. Your CRM system. Yeah, our users fill in this CRM system online, then we print out the forms and send them to this other group. Do you know what this other group does with them? No, they weigh them. What form? To count the number of forms you printed out. Okay? All of that can be replaced by something else, start from table. That's all the people, all the infrastructure, all the printing facilities, all the distribution sites, the whole lot. Now, people aren't doing this because they're dark. They're doing this because they're trapped by context. They can't see the environment. I mean, they are counting, and so they are looking at the most effective way how to improve their process flow by counting physical forms. The fact the entire system made sense 
before computing, but doesn't make sense once paper records become electronic records, is irrelevant. They can't see that context. And this sort of stuff is common. I had a, a particular company, a telco company, 1.2 billion they wanted to spend on a private cloud effort. So we mapped it out, and I basically said I can give them the same effect at 25 million. And they were like, how? And I said, it's pretty simple. You pay me 25 million. I'll sit on a beach for five years drinking margaritas, and then I'll phone you up and say we failed. And that way, you'll save all the rest of the money. Now, of course, they were not particularly happy with this, and uh, they're not particularly happy with this because people have inertia, and they had uh, uh, pre-existing capital invested, and there's about 16 different forms of inertia. So that's not what they wanted to hear. They wanted to hear why spending 1.2 billion on a private cloud, which in the end they sold for an undisclosed amount, which was peanuts, to another company. And it had to be undisclosed because it was hiding shame, so they could still say, look, it was a big success. That's why they were looking for things like to justify their decision. Because nothing spells locking like the political capital of spending 1.2 billion on building your own private cloud. You will do anything to justify that, which is why security is often the, the best friend of these executives, as long as you tell them the private cloud is more secure. And of course, when it fails, then it's all your fault as well, because you're the one who told them that it wasn't their decision. So this goes on all over the place. So does spending money on a digital transformation make sense in this environment? No. So quick recap. I talked about the issue of strategy. Um, and my problem was I couldn't see the landscape. I couldn't see the environment. I couldn't effectively communicate. I wasn't there. I learned about the importance of maps. And from that, I learned a whole bunch of patterns. And we'll go through those in the sessions. A few notes, all maps are imperfect representation. They, uh, you don't, can't create a perfect map of space. There are approximations of what exists. One of the key things they're useful for is communication, particularly between multiple teams and multiple different skill sets we can all talk about an environment using a single map. Now, there's a number of questions I've been asked. Is there a right choice, or is every journey different? Now, we're going to do that in the boot camp, where I'm going to go through more about maps and more where they came from and the details. We're going to go in particular into some basic economic patterns and different forms of doctrine. So we're going to look at anticipation. I'm going to talk about the issue of flow. Loads of people do this stuff called process flow at the moment. It's one of the most you know, improving process, but one of the most costly things you can do. It's a real horror stories there. And then I'm going to go into serverless, you know, why the future is serverless. It's all about the runtime. And you can make money for the next 10 to 15 years on containers and Kubernetes if you wish to. Um, but that is not where the direction the industry is going in. Then we're going to talk about how to do cell-based structures for security. So I'm going to talk about the problem with cell-based uh, uh, structures. We'll go into the fact that there's no such thing as one size fits, fits all culture in an organization. We'll talk about pioneer settlers and town planners, the importance of doctrine again, a bit more detail on that, and which parts of doctrine matter more. And then I've got an exercise for you to do because I'm cruel. After this, we're going to look at how to categorize patterns because you, you hear lots of people talk about the top 10 secret success, successful whatever. And the problem is there are different types of patterns. Some are context specific, some you don't have choice over, and some are universal. So we're going to talk about the problem, how you categorize it, we'll do more on anticipation, we'll look at weak signals and go into the issue of China, and then I'll give you one major lesson from that. And the last session, uh, we're going to talk about how to coordinate between different PST groups. Uh, so we'll talk about the problem of communication, particularly to do with inertia. Inertia is a major issue of organization. And we'll talk about how to hopefully uh, at least fix it to some extent uh, through the use of spend control. So, so that's me. This is all Creative Commons. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Okay. So, um, warning map is going on. Uh, and then a whole other session will be going on in parallel. So cool. uh, enjoy your day and see each other at lunch. Thank you.